Cost containment is clearly a major issue within Europe, so how do you demonstrate value for money across these local environments? Merck is about innovation. When our CEO was appointed 18 months ago, he reiterated our commitment to uh, uh, R&D and to innovation, and we spent $8.5 billion per year uh, uh, in, uh, in R&D. And of course, if you are about innovation, um, you are about demonstrating the value of your drugs. So it's not so much demonstrating the value per se, uh, which is a challenge. What is a challenge is that often the governments, and you talked about the variety of those governments, have a different interpretation as, as to what value is. Which means that at the end of the day, innovative products take much longer to penetrate the market and to reach the patient, because ultimately uh, we bring those innovative products to help cure the patients. And um, if we want to uh, make sure that um, uh, value is recognized, we need to work more with these uh, governments or uh, regions and have them recognize that when a product is truly innovative and bringing uh, that value that they're looking for to the healthcare system, uh, then they facilitate the uh, penetration of that product in the market. By the way, we understand that there is uh, an economic crisis and we understand that like every other sector of society, we have to contribute to the effort that is being made. The issue is that uh, it's not proportionate to what we represent, uh, what the drug budget represents in the healthcare system. It will have an impact on the long term, our long term ability to invest into uh, R&D and to bring further innovative uh, products now. We will see that in 10, 15 years' time because that's the cycle, as you know, uh, that we have to go through in our industry. If we step back from the pricing end of things, how does value for money factor into the earlier drug development process? So as you know, in the old days, it was um, what we had to demonstrate was uh, simply efficacy and safety of a drug. Uh, over the last few years, we have had more and more to include some more economic uh, consideration into the development of drugs and that's frankly part of the way we work now. So what happens is that we start looking at uh, uh, the uh, uh, impact of reimbursement frankly from uh, phase two uh, now when we develop a product. I mean, it's particularly important here in Europe uh, because as, you've, as you know Europe is I would say perhaps more advanced uh, in this area uh, with the uh, uh, with the, the likes of NICE and EQUIG and clearly it's becoming uh, very important in Europe. But we see that uh, it's a parameter which is being taken into account in more and more of the countries now. Pharma, like many industries, is now operating in a truly global environment. So how does Europe remain competitive within that environment? So Europe, um, um, historically, uh, has been very important to the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, uh, it's where the pharmaceutical in industry started. Uh, and, um, and it is true that people are looking at emerging markets today and saying it's all happening there. Well, I would tell you that uh, if you look at some uh, facts uh, about Europe, for example, last year, the, um, the number of patent applications uh, was at an all-time high. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry in the high-tech sector is the single biggest contributor to the uh, uh, trade balance uh, for Europe with a surplus of 47 billion euros. At the same time, uh, our population are aging in Europe, so we need to make sure that uh, uh, that um, we stay vigilant, you know, and uh, and um, uh, because frankly, the world, the pharmaceutical world, is changing as well. Uh, R&D is not as productive as it was in the past. You just have to look at the uh, the statistics uh, when. Uh, uh, in the last, uh, I think it's in the last 20 years, the R&D budgets have been multiplied by four, and yet the number of NCEs have, has remained uh, has remained uh, constant. And the solutions, frankly, to have a strong industry in Europe is to find the right balance between budgetary considerations and the need for having innovative products, uh, innovative products, and that will, for me, uh, include what is being put in place by most of the governments in Europe and also the EU Commission, which is really promoting the healthcare sector as a sector of growth. Um, so we need to have tax incentives and the right education systems to ensure that we have the right skills uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, for me, that's a given. But we also need to make sure that um, um, we promote public-private partnerships. 
I think that uh, uh, it's the best way to ensure that we have innovative, uh, innovative products uh, in Europe. And we need to make sure that the governments recognize that if they want to have a strong industry and they want to promote the industry, uh, they also need to facilitate access to innovative drugs and they need to frankly pay for those innovative drugs. And you touched on partnerships there, Bruno. So what do you see as key for these partnerships to work between pharma, healthcare systems and academia? Moving forward, what we need is a um, policy and the uh, creation of an environment that will favour those public-private partnerships. And there are some people who say that perhaps we should create a Silicon Valley of uh, healthcare uh, in Europe or perhaps recreate what has helped the Silicon Valley uh, come to being. I'm not sure that's the answer uh, uh, in Europe. I think that what is important is that um, they promote uh, these collaborations between the different, uh, the different uh, sectors being academia or public uh, funded research and the, the private sector but they also they facilitate the uh, uh, acceleration of the penetration of innovative drugs into, uh, uh, into, the, uh, into the healthcare systems. And finally, as we see fewer blockbuster drugs coming through, combined with the patent cliff, we're seeing pharma companies adapt in all kinds of different ways. How is Merck adapting to these challenges and where do you see the company in 10 years' time? So as I said before, Merck is all about innovation. Uh, traditionally, uh, uh, we have spent an enormous amount of resources into, uh, into the development of uh, new and innovative drugs. We'll continue to do that. We're also starting to explore uh, other areas, what we call adjacencies, uh, in the area of services, and it's particularly true uh, here in the, um, in, the, uh, in the UK, where the NHS is very open to collaborating with the private sector in order to uh, ensure the best outcome for the patients. And for example, we are running a few pilots here in the UK uh, in, um, in the area of uh, telemedicine or, uh, or uh, patient uh, risk stratification uh, as well and working with the NHS in order to try to find some solutions. Another area where we are working quite uh, a bit is adherence. Uh, adherence is an issue uh, and, uh, and has been an issue for decades and we are trying to find ways to improve patient adherence because if you want drugs to work, patients have to take them. We need to make sure that uh, we work in this area as well. Bruno, thanks very much for your time and for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.